Welcome to this TechZone presentation about transformers at Visma. My name is uh, Klaus Dahl. I'm the team manager for the ML Assets team. Uh, we're a team inside Visma building a reusable machine learning for a host of Visma's products. You should watch this talk if you're interested in uh, learning a little bit about uh, natural language processing. If you'd like to know what a transformer is and why it's an interesting concept, if you want to know a little, learn about something called GPT-3, or maybe you know about that already and would like to know a little bit more, or if you'd like to know how Visma is applying these technologies to improve our products. Let's dive in. If you're already following the machine learning news, you probably already heard about GPT-3. It's a really, really big language model that came out uh, built by OpenAI, came out last year. It, because of the peculiar workings of GBD3, uh, it has been something of a sensation. A whole industry has sprung up around doing demos of things you can suddenly do based on GBD3. And I'll, I'll uh, tell you why uh, in a little bit. But before I do that, uh, maybe uh, I'd like to fill you in, give you a little uh, history lesson about the recent history of the field of natural language processing. If we go back uh, maybe 10 years, uh, we come to what I'll now call the dark ages of natural language processing. That's a little bit unfair. A lot was going on, things were improving, but uh, we're back in the time when basically machine learning for natural language didn't actually work. Uh, you could do some things somewhat, but it really, really didn't work. Dictation software didn't really work. Uh, you would hear about progress and promises made by uh, all of these companies working in the field, and it wouldn't actually work. It would be a little bit, little bit fuzzy, and you'd see embarrassing demos uh, of machine learning failing all the time. Then around uh, 2010, uh, something happened that uh, started to move the field uh, quite a bit. The, that was the advent of recurrent neural networks. So recurrent neural networks are networks specifically designed to learn sequences of things. Uh, so of course, language is sequential in nature. Uh, and so they turned out to be very useful for uh, language processing and started to win all of these machine learning competitions that are out there, uh, known tasks that people solve with uh, uh, machine learning. Machine translation all of a sudden began to work uh, to a reasonable level, uh, which it hadn't before. So a lot has been going on, and uh, recurrent neural networks have been the standard for this kind of thing uh, for the last uh, few, from 2010 and on, uh, until a few years ago when something new happened. Around 2017, a new model came about uh, called Transformers, uh, and uh, started to slowly take over the world of natural language processing. And uh, this talk, in this talk, I'll explain uh, how, why, and how uh, that is. So uh, before we do that, maybe go back to uh, recurrent neural networks. What's good about them? What's bad about them? So the good thing about recurrent neural networks is exactly the recurrence. So what a recurrent neural network is, is it's a neural network that explicitly tries to uh, maintain the context of a sequence. So when you want to understand a word in a sequence, of course it matters what came before. You can't look at the word in isolation. You have to understand the rest of the uh, sentence that you're uh, analyzing. And that's what recurrent neural networks do very explicitly. Whenever you process a particular word, you're also looking at the context of all the words that, that came before. But as you can maybe surmise from the drawing that you have on the screen here, uh, they are a little bit complicated. Uh, they're complicated to implement uh, and uh, train. And uh, the recurrence itself also means that uh, they are hard to parallelize. So whenever you process a word in a recurrent neural network, you need to actually process all of the other words first uh, because the context has to be present before you can do any computation on the word. And that means that you can't really parallelize the sequence. You have to treat the sequence as a sequence in your model, and that makes the computation somewhat harder to scale to the really, really big models uh, that you want. Basically, the core history of machine learning is that if you want to get better, you have to get bigger. 
So uh, it's a bit of a blocker that this is hard to do for RNAs. And that's exactly what happened uh, then a few years ago uh, to kind of get around this, a new uh, way of modeling this uh, context uh, came about. You still need to, if you want to understand language, you can't get around this problem of understanding context. So you do need to find a way to model it. But it turned out there was another way uh, that was able to learn as well as the recurrent neural networks. And the new way of learning uh, language is uh, something called attention. So the, the breakthrough paper came from Google a few years ago with the very promising title, Attention is All You Need. And what's attention? Well, the gist is that instead of this recurrence, that where you this recursive uh, computation that you do in the recurrent neural networks, you can replace that with the uh, more of a flat uh, model, where you're basically learning for each uh, word uh, a pattern, if you will, for which other words in the sentence might be useful to understand that word. So you can think of it as basically learning a mask. Which of these other words do I need to consider? Um, uh, when I process a particular word. The upshot is that the model is, uh, you can process all of the words at once, learn the mask, and th this scales a lot better in terms of the computation. And that means you, we are able to do longer sequences, we're able to process more data, and basically that's what you want to do. Show the model all the data you can, have a big enough model to represent all the data you have, and get bigger and bigger data sets into the model. That's been the key to the success of the Transformers. So it's been a very productive few years. First out of the gate was uh, Google's BERT model, and then a whole family of BERT-derived models came out. There's a, there's a ton of these. And then uh, certainly in terms of the public relations of the thing, uh, the GPT series of models from OpenAI have also caused quite a stir. A key concept here is the concept of uh, fine-tuning. So maybe I'll just explain what fine-tuning is. So. Uh, in the old days when you did machine learning, what you'd do is you'd run the fairly standard loop that you do all the time. You'd uh, find some data that was relevant, that kind of have some data that represents the task you're trying to learn. You would uh, put that through an algorithm and train a model based on that. And that's the end of the story. Uh, of course, the problem here uh, is that uh, if you want to rely on understanding language as such, you need to first represent language. And to do that, you need basically to train a machine learning model on a massive data set that uh, realistically shows you all of the patterns that you want to understand a particular language. So now you have, for most uh, language processing tasks, you now have this two-step process where you first uh, have to uh, run a kind of a pre-training. Uh, so you basically take all the data you can find and train a really, really big model on a task where you don't really care necessarily so much about the task. It's mainly there to learn the language representation. So when you have a, a neural network, you're always learning two things. You're learning how to best understand and kind of compress, if you will, the uh, features that you have on the input side of the model. And then you're also learning how to solve the particular task you have. In pre-training, you're only interested in the feature representation. You're trying to learn the patterns of the language you're putting in, in, in natural language processing. Then once you've done that successfully, you can kind of forget about the task you were solving for and uh, basically take this representation and put it into your own model with whatever data you have and adapt it to your task. This is called fine-tuning. So. Um, the important, uh, the key, a key concept when you're doing fine tuning is uh, the concept sample efficiency. So what you want out of this uh, very expensive pre-training process is that uh, the model you have is able to adapt to smaller data sets. And that's, we call that sample efficiency. So basically the higher the sample, you can kind of guess it from the words, the, the more value you get out of each sample, the more efficient you say the model is. So basically, if you can train, uh, if you have a model that you can train uh, with only very limited data, you say you have very high sample efficiency. If you need a lot of data to adapt to a problem, you have low sample efficiency. So that's the, the key concept here. So that's Transformers. What's GPT-3 then? Well, 
GPT-3, it's uh, people mostly just say it as kind of this uh, totem thing, but uh, the words actually, the letters actually mean something. So GPT-3 is, uh, me, mean, it means Generative Pre-trained Transformer 3. It's called 3 because it's in a part of a series. Uh, OpenAI started out with GPT-1, then they built GPT-2, and now they're currently at GPT-3, it's the most recent model. Uh, they are, of course, building the next one uh, as we speak. Uh, but uh, what has the, the big change? They are very similar. The models. The big change is how big OpenAI have been able to make them. So they started out with hundreds of millions of parameters, then they built uh, what was at the time a massive model of 1.5 billion parameters, and then last year they released this mastodon, uh, 175 billion parameters. A completely unheard of. Uh, number at the time. Let's talk a little bit about what the words actually mean. So pre-trained, well, that means exactly what I just said. It's a pre-trained model. Uh, transformer is the architecture we're talking about. And generative means that what GPT is able to do is generate language. So uh, that's a, the particular thing that uh, GPT is designed to do. All right. When uh, OpenAI published this model, there, there was a paper that came out, and here's the what I think is the most important uh, graph from that uh, paper. So they describe uh, something called few-shot learning and zero-shot learning. So recall sample efficiency, uh, the term sample efficiency. What we mean by that, when, what, when we say few-shot learning, we're talking about basically being able to learn a task from only very few examples of the task. So we're talking about extremely high sample efficiency. That's what few-shot learning is. Zero-shot learning means showing the model no examples at all. So it's how does what does that even mean? Well, we are talking about language model here, models here. So what they mean by zero-shot learning is that instead of showing the machine learning algorithm an example of what the task, what a solution to the task means, they'll simply just describe the task. What is it I'm trying to do? And uh, here's the, the important graphic. So when they built GPT-3, they tried various model sizes. So what you're looking at here is a small model, 1.3 billion parameters, a bigger one with 13 billion, and one with 175 billion parameters. What you're seeing here is kind of the vertical axis is how good the models are. And what you're seeing here is that uh, once you get to this really, really big model, the GPT-3 biggest model, that really, 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 oh, sorry about the light there, that really, really pushes uh, the size you can get, the size of the data set you can get by with to down to a bare minimum. So what you can see down here on the axis is that uh, you can do with 10 examples, that's this point that I'm at here. Uh, you can do with, with uh, 10 examples uh, almost everything that you can do with even uh, with one example or, or less. That's, that's quite amazing uh, that uh, going up in size uh, matters so much for the sample efficiency. And it's a, it's a core concept uh, in understanding the attractiveness of these uh, transformer models and these really, really big language models. So, uh, the zero-shot or one-shot nature of GPT, GPT and the fact that it's this generative model means that it's uniquely kind of open-ended in its design. You don't need a data set to start doing a task. You can basically just imagine uh, uh, a problem and just ask the computer if it's, uh, just ask the model if it's able to provide an answer. And that's why people have been trying the craziest things generating love letters, as you see here, generating TV commercial scripts, uh, copywriting, sending email automatically, so many things, building UIs. There are literally thousands of examples of what people are doing here. And the core concept is that you basically have, you need no data, you just need an idea, and then you can try the, the, the model out. That's the, where the creativity uh, comes from. So, of course, uh, you might ask yourself, what has this got to do with business software? Why are we in Visma interested in this model? Well, as it turns out, my team builds something called Visma SmartScan. SmartScan uh, is an invoice processing uh, product. We ingest uh, images of uh, documents, PDFs or images, photos of documents, 
And then we extract financial information for that so that you don't have to type in all the information from the documents that get sent around. And we are, of course, interested in whether this kind of generative approach would, uh, whether GPT-3 would be able to solve our problem. So we, we put GPT-3 to the test. Before I, I get to how that uh, test came about, maybe I can just try to tell you where we are in this landscape of sample efficiency. Uh, it turns out that, well, we are, we are really at a different, we're, the current version of SmartScan, if we're perfectly on it, is a completely different place in the landscape. So, uh, first of all, we, nothing ever starts working uh, with the current version of SmartScan unless we have thousands of examples. So, we are, this whole, this business with trying something with one or ten examples of a task, that simply, we, that generates no results for us at all. We are training on thousands and preferably hundreds of thousands of documents to get good quality. And that is because we, it's a much, much smaller model. So if you want to expand on the, the graphic from the GPT paper, we're kind of uh, uh, out here on the, on the right. Uh, and you have to go very, very far in the number of examples you show the model before our performance starts to pick up. We can get to a very good level. We just need a heck of a lot of data. So back to uh, us and GPT-3. Uh, we wanted to check whether we could uh, generate uh, basically the answer that SmartScan is looking for using GPT-3. And how would we do that? Well, what we do is we take the images that we have, put them through an OCR engine. So that's a character recognition engine. So that instead of an image, we have text. And then we take this uh, text input and simply ask GPT to give us the answer. And uh, the question, of course, would that even work? And it turns out it kind of does, uh, which was uh, something uh, of an eye-opener for, for me and my team. So here's what the process looks like. On the left here, you have the input we give to GPT-3. So we basically tell it, well, here's what the OCR, here's the text of, a, of an invoice. Uh, please give us just the relevant information from the invoice. And then we also just kind of describe the format. We like, you know, a title and a colon and then the value. And look what happens when we put that into the model. It actually starts outputting exactly what we want. It's like explaining this to a, a student helper. Um, in OpenAI, they call this prompt programming. So in, instead of uh, ingesting data sets, uh, and that's how you train a model, you basically just uh, ask the model nicely, uh, as if you had an intern you were trying to get to do the task. So of course, we are a little bit stunned to see this uh, happen. Uh, quite something. So we started to experiment with it a little bit more. And uh, we learned a lot about that. So there are good things and bad things about GPT-3 too, uh, just like there are about the recurrent neural networks. So first, let's start with the good stuff. It kind of works. That is, that when I saw that the first uh, day we tried it, that was amazing, that it would even uh, work at all. But it does. Uh, even more amazingly, the model is uh, able to actually uh, supply information that's not on the document. So in the example you have on your screen here, that's uh, we ingested a Romanian uh, receipt and uh, asked for the amount and so on. And what happened was that uh, the uh, robot uh, figured out that uh, the model figured out that uh, we probably want the standard international currency code for that amount. Uh, and what's uh, remarkable here is that the, the currency code was nowhere on the document. So on the document, you saw the Romanian name for this uh, currency, which is Lei. Uh, uh, but uh, GPT-3 already learned uh, through its uh, pre-training that the, the right currency code in Romania is the RON. So it just output that. And of course, we have this incredible sample efficiency, basically showing it no examples. It, it already works quite well. Uh, what's, uh, there's a couple of things that are not so impressive about GPT-3. So first of all, if you've been paying really, really close attention to the past example and this example, you'll notice that I actually had to change the prompt. So I'm not asking the same question. We had to kind of tune it a little bit to get the right output. 
So in a, we're basically cheating, is what I'm telling you. So, and we had to do that to get the results. The other thing, of course, is that uh, as remarkable and impressive it is that uh, GPT will make up this data, of course, it also raises the concern that it could be making up the other data. So it could also be making up the amount uh, and the dates and so on. And that, of course, is something we would not like, uh, made up answers, because there's no way, it's not like the model can tell us whether the uh, data that it's outputting is made up or not. So we'd have to figure that out on our own. A third aspect is that uh, after playing with it a little while, we could see that zero shot is just not going to get the performance. We would actually like to train it on hundreds of examples, and that's not currently possible. OpenAI does not have an API for, for fine tuning uh, available. And then there's the last bit, because the model is so very, very big, it's extremely expensive to run. So the, the cost of uh, doing these predictions is very, very high. So maybe if we took a step back, we can kind of say, OK, it seems this approach works. It seems really big models work. It seems transformers work. How can we kind of blend that with what's good about SmartScan? So we want something that's cheaper to run and use, that is more easily controlled so that we have a better control over the output that gets out. But we want to ex exploit transformers as an architecture. So smart scan is a little bit different. First of all, one of the things that is uh, key to smart scan is that we have this guarantee that the data we are outputting is always data that is on the document. In fact, all of our answers, whenever we provide an answer uh, with smart scan, we also tell you exactly what text in the document uh, we believe cost, uh, is the source of this answer. So there's always some evidence that we present along with the answer. Uh, and that, of course, uh, helps us uh, a lot in reducing the number of errors we're able to produce. At least the document has to actually have the information present. But maybe we can blend the approach. Maybe we can build a transformer model that still has the strengths of smart scan, but also has the size and scope uh, of these new uh, language models. And that's uh, what we've actually been doing the last few months uh, within my team. Uh, we're not, of course, doing this in isolation. Other people are interested in this task, too. So uh, as it happens, uh, last year, actually, a, a team uh, from Microsoft built a big transformer model for understanding uh, structured documents like uh, invoices and receipts, uh, something called Layout LM that they published last year. And what we've done here in Visma is uh, look at Layout LM, uh, pick out all of the good parts, make some improvements of our own, and adapt it to uh, the data that we have available in uh, Visma. And uh, what has come out of that is something we have jokingly called VPT1, uh, Visma Pre-Trained Transformer number one. So it's uh, number one, of course, because it's our very first uh, model out of the gate. Uh, it is a pre-trained transformer, so that seems valid, and we built it here at Visma, so why not? VPT1. In terms of how big it is, we've uh, positioned us ourselves uh, in between the first two generations of uh, the GPT series of models. So VPT1 has around half a billion uh, parameters. Uh, so that's a good deal bigger than GPT1, but a little bit smaller than GPT2. Uh, and for reference, I just put in here the latest transformer model that uh, Google has announced they've built with a ridiculous one trillion parameters, and also where we are with the current smart scan down at the one million level. The uh, x-axis here is a logistic scale. Uh, that's how that works. So it, every, every step is 10 times more data. And does that actually work? Yes, it does. So if we go back to this uh, quality we are looking for, sample efficiency, uh, we can see that uh, we do indeed get the performance benefits we're hoping. So in uh, VPT1, we've uh, kind of tried to solve the same problem on different uh, data set sizes. And what we're seeing is that, um, oh, you may recall from earlier in my presentation, I told you that current smart scan is trained on hundreds of thousands of documents. Uh, so that's where we currently are. What we can see now is that on much smaller data sets, down to even the size of 1,000 documents, we can get the same performance. 
So what I'm listing here is basically the position of the model, so how, the, how many of the answers we give is correct. And we're able to match the position of our current uh, production smart scan training on even small data sets of 1,000 documents. Uh, why is that interesting if we have a lot more data to train on? Well, for two reasons. First of all, if we can do that, bigger data is always better. So if we can get a particular level of quality with a thousand documents, we can get even higher quality with bigger data sets. And that's actually what you're seeing here is if we then go up to the data we have available, we exceed the current performance quite, quite significantly. Even more interestingly, we're able to do useful machine learning even down to the level of 100 documents. So we can now train uh, new tasks for SmartScan on data sets that are that small. Uh, the importance of that is that uh, a lot, oops, sorry about the light there. The importance of that is that a lot of times um, the, uh, for a lot of new tasks, we maybe don't have hundreds of thousands of documents. So uh, imagine we are trying to solve a completely new business problem uh, where we don't have a kind of a, a, a history of thousands of customers already solving we're already solving this problem for, then we actually need to hand create the data set. Hand creating a data set of hundreds of thousands of documents, that's very time consuming and expensive. Creating a data set of a few hundred documents to kind of bootstrap a new problem, that's uh, very, very simple and cheap to do. So when we roll this out, um, we will be able to adapt to new uh, tasks, new problems, new business domains, new uh, countries that we're doing business in using only very small data sets, which is a significant advantage of the model. So now that we've uh, figured out that this is an approach that actually works, what's actually next for me and my team and the Visma Transformer? Well, obviously, uh, we want to roll this out. So that's a, a big effort for us this year, is to put this in the hand of our customers uh, and uh, get that extra bit of quality out of it. And then, of course, uh, now that we've figured out, uh, we've started on this journey of scaling up our model, we've uh, certainly not ended that. So basically, the other big goal we have is to move up and to the right in this uh, graphic. So scale up our model to a vastly bigger size uh, beyond GPG-2 and get the quality that comes from that. Later in the year, we will also uh, be working on uh, rethinking what a generative model is and seeing if we can find uh, an, a new way to approach uh, generative uh, machine learning. The as you saw maybe from the set of demos there, or as you may have been seeing in the news, there's a lot of potential in generative modeling. There's a lot of things we can't do when we have this requirement that uh, the answer has to be in the document. So for example, uh, you can imagine in a business context uh, do solving bookkeeping problems. It's not always apparent from a document what, how, what the handling of the document should be. So we'd like to learn what the handling should be. Uh, and that might, uh, we might need the generative models for that. But before we get to that, uh, we do need to solve the controllability. We can't just uh, have a model that uh, uh, goes off and, and makes uh, wild claims uh, like GPT-3 does. So we need to find a way to balance that out. Uh, and that's, of course, a future research for uh, me and my team. So uh, that was the story uh, from me about the transformers and how we're using them here in Visma. I hope you found this interesting. Thank you so much for listening and hope to see you another time in another Tech Zone talk. Mm -hmm.